everyone. Thank you so much for, for coming to, the, to today's uh, Renchi reading. Um, we have uh, the poets from No Choice But To Follow. And um, I'm going to introduce myself first. My name is Anne Inoshita. I'm an instructor here at Leeward Community College. And um, I teach English classes. Um, I have a book called Manoa Stream that has local um, poetry. Um, also, I'm proud to be a member of this <laughs> group as well. Um, I also have a play. Uh, uh, called Where I Stay, a play in Hawaii that has been in uh, the Statehood Project uh, performed by Kuhua Omanoa, um, excuse me, performed by um, <laughs> uh, Kumu Kuhua Theater. And um, my first book was published by um, Kuhua Omanoa. All right, I'd like to introduce um, everyone here. Um, first of all, uh, Juliet S. Kono. And if you could, oh, thank you so much. Oh. Hi. You can ask me questions. <laughs> I don't. My mind is someplace else. Um, but anyway, um, I'm retired from Leeward. I retired in December, and um, I'm really, really enjoying my life, retired life. <laughs> I did enjoy it here, but this is sort of different. Um, but I'm working harder than ever. Uh, what else can I say? I know I have. Uh, former student here um, and um, anyway have a really great time I want you to listen to us and um, you can talk story with us later okay Oops. hi I'm Christy Passion I'm the anchor of our Renshi link um, Juliet is very modest she's wrote several novels, several books, children's books. She's a very accomplished writer. So I felt very, very honored when I was invited to be part of this Renshi group because I'm the novice writer of the group. I'm actually by trade a critical care nurse. I work at Queens Medical Center. Um, if you're in a trauma, you will be looking at me. Uh, so I hope to not meet you that way. But I do write as well, so I was very excited. This, this is our first collection, my first published book. And I have my own book coming out in April, so I'm very excited about that. And I look forward to reading with you guys today. Hi, I'm Jean Toyama, and for the last uh, five years, I have been, a, is this on? I've been a struggling writer, trying to combat writer's fear, writer's block. But I've been able to eke out a few books, but I don't want to talk about them. I want to talk about what I used to do before was teach French. And you have a French program here? Good. I used to know uh, your first French teacher, Ju um, Jacqueline Foschman. She and I went to school together. I know she retired. But that was what I did in my past life. The, 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 for the present life, I've been trying to write and struggling writer. and. I came up with this group to do the Renshi. Now, Renshi, I'd like to talk a little bit about Renshi, but before I do that, I have to do a commercial. Our presence here is sponsored by Bamboo Ridge, which I hope you'll ask us questions about what is, ba how many of you know what Bamboo Ridge is? A few of you, okay, we'll talk about that later. And we're, um, we're sponsored by the uh, Hawaii Council for the Humanities, which is part of the National Council for the Humanities, so we have a grant from them. So we have to acknowledge their um, generosity in aiding us to do what we love to do. Now, getting back to the Renshi, how many of you have heard the word Renshi before? Good, you heard it from this book? Renshi means linked poetry. And it is a modern version of a very ancient Japanese practice of poetry called Renga or Renku, which started in the Heian Jidai, which is in the 800s and 900s. And it evolved through the years, changing with the way society changes. Because the first part of uh, Renshi, which was Renga, was written primarily by the aristocrats. Then in the uh, 17th century, when there were people who had more money, the bourgeois started writing Rengu, and that was Renku, and that was with Basho. Now, if you know one form of Japanese poetry, what word, what form do you know? Haiku, good. Renshi, Renga, Renku was started out 
the, as the um, haiku started out as a part of the reng, sh uh, renga. The first haiku is how many um, lines? Three, three lines, five, seven, five. That's 17 syllables. So they had a poem of 17 syllables. But the original uh, tanka, which is the whole form of the Japanese poem, was 57577. Seven, seven. So you've added all of that up, that was the whole poem. And in aristocratic Japan, every experience was expressed in some kind of poetic fashion. So if you read, have you read um, Tales of Genji? It's full of poetry because every aristocrat, to, sh to show the quality of their is, uh, emotion, to, the to show the quality of their spirit, would write a poem about an event. So now, in the 21st century, we have the real bourgeois, bourgeois kind of ren ga, ren shi, it becomes link poetry. So what we did in uh, 2010 was write a ren shi to celebrate the uh, 35th anniversary of Bamboo Ridge. So what we did was write a poem, each of us a poem a month. That means we had one week to write each poem. So I wrote the first poem and I posted it on the internet and then Juliet caught the poem and she would write her poem based on the last line of my poem. Then she threw the poem to Anne, and Anne would do the same. And she had one week, and then Christy was the last one. And then Christy would throw her poem at me. This was all on the internet, through, it, uh, was on the internet, on the Bamboo Ridge um, site. And I would do that, and we did that for the full year. And so today, what we're going to do is read you two months. Okay, so that you can t uh, t see how we linked our poems together. And we're going to be doing, um, starting with March. And we're doing March because I like the last line that Christy sent me, which was, through my jalousied windows. So my title is Jalousied Windows. Okay, I'm going to read, you want to stand up? I see her look at you. She tilts her head ever so cutely and laughs so brightly. I close the slats against that look, hers and yours. Those half-opened eyes taking in all that light from her white teeth. I close it shut, then open. She's gone and you walk up the steps coming home. Coming home. You were once told, no matter what happens, you can always come home. Come home, I'll be waiting. So will the fields, the tree by your window, the collection of matchbox cars on the sill. Your room as it was your room is as you left it. Clothes that smell of you remain in the closet. I haven't had the heart to. Should you walk up the hill, I will see from my kitchen window the flurry of the roadside grass in the rising dust. I will drop the potato I'm peeling, and my hands will fly to my mouth. I will run out to greet you, embrace as you breeze by. Embrace, voices from book pages, let me forget the daily noise. So I embrace words as the pages exhale. Time does not matter when I relate to aches and delights. Somehow everything is bearable, one page at a time. One page. Pressed between Webster's Gotten and Grand, Mama keeps your letter. One page. To remind me when I'm at a loss for words. Those words always the same. I'm sorry, Mama. I understand now. Soon, real soon. But your release got pushed back twice since then, already seven years ago. I see your dashed out script, the curves of D's and B's never touching the base. Detached, your subconscious slip, my missed warning sign like the forged checks, threats to mama at her work, 
or finding Jesus four more times before the cops finally took you away. It was hard on her the first few years, hard being patted down for visits, smiling while ignoring each new tat, but I had to settle with the bank, play deaf to whispering neighbors at the Safeway, at the Chevron, at the... Who gonna hire him when he get out? I cup mama's weathered hands in mine, wounded birds trembling. God going to take care. God going to take care. Finding the right words I need, I move you in between irresponsible and irretrievable. Close this book, Faithless Without Memory. Faithless Without Memory. He didn't think about the after, or the before for that matter. The time it didn't work, the time all failed, the time we said no, 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 never again. No, he didn't think about that. He just meddled and muddled, believing it would work without plan, without knowledge, without loss of our sons, our daughters, our husbands, our wives, our fathers, our mothers, our friends and acquaintances, names in the newspapers, names on the newscasts, all 4,273 of them with more to come, believing it could be done without caring about the nameless other sons and daughters, wives and husbands, fathers and mothers, friends and acquaintances whose name will never appear with all the other names to be written on the marble waves crushing the shores of our remembrance. Of our remembrances. We don't want to remember what illuminates the smallness of our hearts. As on the morning I saw you grip your knees and break into a cold perspiration that glistened on your face like glycerin tears. I wanted to be off out of the house and free of you. The gnarly trees of your age and fears of what you called your naughty illness that hindered my run across the meadows. Tucking the nitro tablet under the log of your tongue, I patted your hand and released you to your knot of pain. I didn't wait to see, was the pill working? I had makeup to apply, last minute notes to make, the laundry to take out. You called to me, asked if I would massage the pain in your back and arm. I don't have time, I said, your howling eyes following me out the door. It was not the usual angina, a flaw that sent you toppling. Until today, I can't look into my memory of your eyes. My memory of your eyes. In album pages, I look at 30-year-old photos, a skinny girl with short black hair parted to the side with a pin securely placed by her mother. Her eyes hold personality, joy, and unknowing. I place my finger on a photo holding the girl's hand, glad that the camera saved her eyes when time did not spin and take everything. These are the eyes of a girl who is outside, smiling in the wind. Smile in the wind. Many years later, he watches her sleep, the white hair, hollow skin, frozen lines dwindling. He can't remember her laugh down at the boathouse by Alawai, where dances were held every Saturday night. So many parked cars, they had to walk as far as three blocks, but they could hear it from that distance, the bass, the horns, taste the Latin notes as they held hands under a copper sky, hurrying toward the lighted pavilion. Arthur Lyman's band wailing as they stepped over conga beats towards the boys from McKinley, wearing palmade ducktails and tailored shirts, acknowledges them with a smirk, one arm around her and the other raised high, a king over his court, a good time, a lifetime. But there are also accusations over lunch breaks. How come you no answer the phone when I call? Every smile a threat. Why he looking at you, you fucking whore? Stay home, shit. But baby needs diapers and electric is two months late. A difficult time, a lifetime, cutting him at all sides. No good Filipino boy. You had a truck driver for Love's Bakery. Get that nice looking hopper girl. What's she doing at him? Too bad, yeah? Rusty nails through his shoe. 
He goes out to the rainy porch now, lights another Marlboro, glimpses her smile in the smoke curling back in the wind, takes another drag, feels his tumor grow. Okay, I have a question. <laughs> I have a question. Do you think we had any rules? <laughs> Too hard, huh? <laughs> what do you think was the only rule we had? Yeah. Right? <laughs> Winner. First rule. What other rule? There was four. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> write it in one week. Or yeah, write, write it, it in <laughs> one week. Yeah, so we had those two rules. The interesting thing about the Japanese Rengas and Renku is that they had hundreds of rules. And you had to follow the rules about certain kinds of flowers that had to appear routinely, but not some flowers, but these flowers. And certain kinds of images that you could not have in the poems. You could not talk about women. You could have one, one I think, in a hundred with a tiger in it. But the first poet would write the 575, the next poet would do the 7-7, seven, seven. the next poet would do the 5-7-5, five, seven, five. and the next poet would do the 7-7. Seven, seven. And they had a referee. If they didn't follow the rules, they didn't accept the, the poem. And what they would do is they'd have a secretary with all the papers lined up, and if they followed the rules, then the secretary would write the poem as they went along. And this usually took over a certain period of time, and they had hosts who had to provide all the food. And so, once in a while, you'd have a host, after so many rounds, who went bankrupt because they were trying to outdo each other. Now, yes? I have a question. So when you were reading, you were not reading each person's individual submission. You were reading a lot more than that? Because it didn't sound like uh, but it sounded like at first somebody would get up and they would read five seven five seven seven, but then over time the readings got a lot longer. So you oh well, we didn't have any of those rules. We could write whatever length it was, as long as it wasn't really long. Okay. A certain okay. length. So nobody wrote said five seven five. Okay. We just well, it's just I'm a short I'm a short poetry writer. <laughs> <laughs> these, uh, these other two are long-winded. <laughs> <laughs> you have any other questions? Thank you. The process? How we got together? Are you curious? <laughs> are you shy? Huh? You're shy. Well, Otherwise, I'm, I'm going to ask all the questions. How do you all know each other? Okay. Um, for the 35th anniversary, the Bamboo Ridge editors wanted to do something different, something memorable. And almost 20 years before, Wintek Lum, the poet from Bamboo Ridge and I, had participated in a Renshi. And he remembered it, and he said, let's do it. And apparently, I was not part of the group at that time. But he asked, Juliet was part of the group, and what did Wintek try to do? <laughs> well, I was told. I was told after that he asked a lot of the poets who were part of the Bamboo Ridge group to do, to participate in it, and they said, "No, no, we don't want to do that." It was a year-long commitment. Only a crazy person. Right? Only a crazy person. So Winton asked me, "Would you do it?" And I said, "Okay." And then I had to find the rest of them. I only knew Juliet through a name and to say hello once in a while. I didn't know these other two. Their names popped up through email. People said, well, go ask so-and-so. Well, I asked the Bamboo Ridge Ports first, and nobody said yes. And then I asked, I think, Anne. And she said, yes. <laughs> OK, <laughs> you're on. And then Christy, not one hesitation. These two girls are fearless. <laughs> and then Juliet said, well, if they can do it, I can I do, do it, too. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so that's how we did The first time we ever met as, as a group, four of us, face to face, was in July, after we had, or June, no, May. No, June. June, in the, at the Book and Music Festival. We had never seen each other. We got on, we had only known about each other on the oh, internet. 
writing, answering each other's poem. We got on stage and we did the four or five months. I thought it was chicken skin, you know? Yeah. We're amazed at what we did. <laughs> yeah, we didn't know. Yeah. Hey, it's not so bad, yeah. <laughs> Any other question? Yes. Yeah. Um, I had a uh, question about the, uh, you know how you said you were a children's book writer? Oh, I like that. Yeah. Oh, about you, yeah. 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 Okay, so I was uh, trying to uh, write a uh, children's book myself, and uh, the problem is, is trying to, I, I've created all of these characters in this world that uh, the, uh, stories take place in, but it's really hard for me to uh, set up, uh, it's really hard for me to write individual stories to uh, match with the world and uh, the, uh, basically the overall series that I wanted to create. And so I wanted some uh, advice on, on uh, the uh, writing. Basically I wanted to keep like uh, sort of down to earth stories for kids like, like the ones you typically see in the picture books, so I kind of needed some advice there. I think I would sort of set uh, like age group. First of all, this is for age maybe five to nine, or first graders through third graders. And um, I mean, I'm not too sure what kind of stories you want to write. It's basically sort of sci-fi along the lines of like the Jetsons and this uh, one ride from oh. Epcot that I saw online called Horizons, if anyone remembers it. Okay. What, what you need to do perhaps is to write scenes or episodes and see how, you know, um, that works out for you. Because the, these cannot be really, really long books, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe you need to yeah, set up a scene Take a couple of characters because you can't have a lot of characters in the book, um, and you know, make and fiddle around with it and start writing uh, you know, maybe ten episodes or ten scenes and see what what happens to them. Try that, and mainly uh, something like that I think would be. mainly dialogue and some um, some some paragraphs that would just advance the story. So I don't know. Anybody got a re I just keep on re I, I don't write children books. I wrote for children poetry. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you just familiarize with yourself with what other people are writing in the genre that you want to do, which is probably what you're doing. Yeah. And just keep on at it. It's fortitude and stick to <laughs> Yeah, it's hard. How many of you are uh, attempting to write? Yeah, right. it's just keep on doing it. Don't stop yeah. and don't don't self-censor or berate yourself. Just mm -hmm. do it. W what are you writing about? I mean, what? Well, I've actually have written a couple of novels, 100 pages a piece. Nothing ever published. I just do it for the fun of it. Um, mm -hmm. That's good. Um, That's good. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> and it just varies from anything uh, medieval. It could be a modern story. Mm -hmm. Mostly it revolves around things that have happened to me and then I just put them onto into a book. That's the way to do it. Mm -hmm. yes. um, Bamboo Ridge is always looking for material and uh, you know send it out. We have a, a part of, you know the Bamboo Ridge website? There are, there's bamboo shoots. Sometimes they have stories they ask for stories. Mostly poetry, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mostly poetry, but stories you can... And then they're called for papers. I mean, called for... Submission. Yeah. 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 I mean, you always want to get your first rejection slip, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Is there any, like, uh, sort of rules for uh, submissions in... Oh, yes. Each um, individual 
um, press will have their own new set of rules, but basically they're, you know, pretty much alike, but they will give you the number of words or pages or whatever to support. This last issue was the first time they accepted electronic submissions. Any other questions about this? We, 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 haven't, we haven't finished yet. No. <laughs> but if you have any questions about the Renshi, the process. No? Okay. okay. Oh, you want to start with your, since everybody has written stuff, we're going to share with you what we all, we've already done. And then we'll end up with our latest Renshi project. Okay. Okay. So, I'll do audience choice. These two poems are coming from oh, from my book that uh, will be published in April. And I hope you guys come to the Hawaii Book and Music Festival. I'll be there. Come say hello to me. Okay, which one sounds more exciting to you guys? Kings or marriage advice? Marriage advice? Is that something the group needs here? Okay, marriage advice. There we go. Maybe in the immediate future or in the future future? <laughs> marriage advice. Old proverbs will tell you marriage is children in tears. Your aunt swears lipstick holds it together. And your sister insists Jesus is the answer. But I can only say what I know. Put away everything you think is important. Cooking, cleaning, diapering. Those will come like a flood. No need to advance into that current marriage will take you there. What you have to do is learn to build a raft, something to hold on to when the tides turn. Build it out of anything you can get your hands on, compliments, sturdy shoulders, tomorrow. Those things will do when you are young. You can weather many storms with those. But when your raft springs a leak, he loses his job, your back gives out, and you start drifting down, you will have to build another with whatever there is. It might be quiet, magazines, or forgetting. It might have to be lies. Those can last for a while. The strongest one I built was made out of television and forgiveness. I thought it would last forever. Even at my age, we build or drown. You want this to work? You want happily ever after? Then remember, girl, marriage is labor, and we get through it tougher, not shinier. Okay, then I'm going to read Kings now. <laughs> okay. It's about a robbery. Kings. While the women were in the kitchen split between salting the pork belly and cutting the taro stems, while the nearest kid shuttled another primo to Uncle Pipin before being released to play, the planning gave way to the answer. Kalihi Super Meats. Jimmy was the first to lean in, elbows on the fold-out table. Yes, yes. His car was out of the shop. 7.30 Sunday morning, keep the engine running. He could do that. Norman Boy was on board but kept it cool, slouched in his chair, left arm wrapped into his undershirt, sly smile in his mother's dimples. Bobby just laughed but his hands were steady and his knees stopped bouncing. It took a while to get there. Three hours of shooting the shit, two cases of beer split between four men and challenges to each other's manhood. By the time the late afternoon heat blurred to a cool Kapuhulu evening, it was agreed that Bobby's wife, Clara, would distract the sales clerk while Norman Boy and Uncle Pipin worked the manager. Two grand easy, maybe even three. There was no urgency or disguise in their talk, just a repetition of ideas polished to all were assured and shiny. The evening star was luminous in its indigo slice of sky. The rest of the brazen stars followed, unwavering like the gaze of badass angels. They raised their bottles up to those ancients, to their uncles, fathers, and grandfathers before them, and were blessed. Exultant as the answer braved edges, their own borders shifted. Each man on that porch, a king, growing larger, stronger, the odds started tipping in their favor, the rules were bending, and if anyone bothered to look at the plumeria trees lining the yard, they would have seen them tremble. Okay, 
So I have um, two poems, and uh, they're pigeon poems. So uh, the first one is TV. Going come dark, so my mother called me for go back inside the house. Can smell tonkatsu from the kitchen, and my mother turn on the TV. Dinner going to be ready soon. I watch TV, and they playing Superman. Mommy, one day I'm going to save everybody. I'm going to be Superman. She turned the tonkatsu over in the pan and tell me, that's one good idea. They get one commercial about trips to Hawaii. Mommy, one day we go in Hawaii. She look at me funny kind. I tell her as one good idea for go Hawaii. Everyone can live in grass shacks and go be good fun for drink the kind tropical drink with the fruit and umbrella and stay outside all the time. She tell me we live Hawaii. I look at her. No, we don't live Hawaii. We live in a house like everybody on the TV. She tell me one more time we live Hawaii and dinner going to be ready pretty soon. My mother don't know what she's talking about. We don't live Hawaii. Now the TV playing one old movie. My mother said it's breakfast at Tiffany's and the lady, the actress, Audrey Hepburn. Look like one nice lady. I like her. Get one wild party and this guy with small eyes talking weird. I don't understand what he's saying. Mommy, who that guy? My mother no answer and she moved the katsu to on one plate. She tell me dinner ready. I eat and she tell me we're going to have spaghetti tomorrow. I like spaghetti. So who the guy with the small eyes in the movie, the one that talk funny? She tell me she don't know who him, but in the movie, he's supposed to be one oriental guy. Yeah. She went nod and tell me for eat. What? Oriental? She looked surprised. Us oriental. <laughs> I thought we Japanese. <laughs> we Japanese? After she pow wash dishes, she hold me close and I can hear her heart and her voice vibrate when she talk. Then she stroke my hair and I get sleepy. My mother thinks she know everything, but she don't know. I'm not Oriental. I don't live Hawaii. And one day I'm going to save everybody just like Superman. <laughs> uh, the other one is called Japan Trip. My family been here a long time. I don't remember when they went leave Japan. We've been here in Hawaii before statehood. My bachan wanted us to visit Japan, but because I'd never been there before, and she went like introduce me to the family. It was one long trip, and my body all tired because I stayed jet lag. We visit all the tourist kind place. I don't know what they think of me. They come up to me and start talking Japanese. Then I got to tell them, wakarimasen. I don't understand what they talking, that's why. Remind me of when I go Waikiki, people extra nice to me, like they're going to sell me something. Then when I open my mouth, they know I'm not from Japan, so they go away. Hey, maybe I get money. Maybe I like buy something, whatever. We go visit my family in the country. At the house, my bachan went drop to the floor and bow so low, I never know what for do. I just standing on the side in my jeans and I feel so stupid. I don't like insult nobody and I don't know what for do. My button start talking Japanese, and I don't know what she talking. More better if I went pay more attention after elementary school, when I used to go to the Hongwanji mission for learn Japanese. Hard for study Japanese, but when you like be like everybody else, and nobody talking Japanese. Look like my button explaining something. Everybody stay nodding and smiling at me. Oh, good thing, man. Weird, yeah, I know how for be in my house, but I don't know what for do here. Sometime, hard for be local. Sometime, hard for be American. And sometime, hard for be Japanese. Sometime, I feel like I don't belong no place. I wonder if people think before they come stay Hawaii. Hawaii good, but I know I will lose something. Hard for go back. Thank you, Anne. Um, I'm going to read something old, and um, I was going to read some sex poems, but I think that um, it's not politically correct, so I'm going <laughs> to read something like this. But even this is not very um, politically correct. I will, I will, I'm thinking about when robbery planning. <laughs> 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 okay, but anyway... Um, I'm going to read about um, my parents and what they told me and who uh, about, I'm sorry. They always told me who I could marry or who I couldn't marry. So this is called Before Time. And even, this, even Japanese, certain kinds of Japanese, it was banned. I mean, they didn't want us to marry certain kinds of Japanese. Crazy, yeah? 
But before time, they said to marry only Japanese and only some of our own kind, not Zuzuben, Batten, Kotonk, Hibaksha, Eta, Uchinanchu, Night Soil Carrier, Big Rope People. Before time, they said not to marry Keto, Gaijing, Haole, Hair People, Foreigner, White, Sailor Boy, Chinese, Clubfoot, One Thumb, Chimba, Mahu, Glass Eye, Hair Lip, Borinki, Pigeon Toe, Porogi, Uncle Joe's Friend, Kanaka, Cane Cutter, Mandolin Player, Night Diver, Puerto Rican, Tree Climber, Nose Picker, Filipino, Thief, Bartender, Jintan Sucker, Korean, Paniolo, Farmer, Bearded, Mustachioed, Teruko's Brother, Daikon Leg, Cane Hauler, Left Handed, Right Handed, Smart Addict, Christian, Poor Speller, Kami, Indian, Leper, Hakka, Cripple, Drunk, Flat Nose, Old, Jupake, Chicken Fighter, Pig Hunter, Moke, Ice Cruncher, Opium Smoker, one side eyebrow razor, fat, olopop, skinny, bunti, thick lip, albino, kurombo. So everybody, I couldn't marry anybody, <laughs> right? I couldn't marry you too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, it goes around and around, right? So this is a scolding from my father. What kind Japanese you? Nothing more worse in this world than one Japanese who like be something he not. No matter how much you like, no can. No can be, howly. Who the girl, you know, the Michael girl, the doctor's daughter, good looking, live in the big house while Luca drive. Big eyes, nice car, blonde hair. You like talk like howly? You like big eyes? You try live their house. No can be Chinese, rich, Wong family rich, Daughter go Honolulu dorm at Punahou. We know more their kind money. Me, I only one mechanic. Your mother baker too at Waikawaina Elementary School cafeteria. And no can be Hawaiian, like Kaylee family daughter. You know which one, the smart one. Good hula dancer, fast swimmer, going mainland. You like dance like her? Nice, nose too she gets, some tall. You like one nose like her? You dreaming girl, come from her mother's side. You want flat nose Japanese because your mother get flat nose. So why you like act different for? Why you like be something you not? You no more shame or what? Eh, you no figure too. Then maybe these guys, they don't like you suck around them. Okay. Thank you. As you can see, we all have very different interests and our poetry is very different. And this one, I just got uh, accepted. It will be posted on the internet somewhere. I don't know where. And it's not like any of your poems. <laughs> okay. The smell of symmetrical men. I read somewhere that the smell of symmetrical men attracts women more than the smell of the asymmetrical kind. Not being able to measure earlobes or hands or anything that could verify the symmetry of bodies, I first sniffed around enclosed spaces like elevators or small rooms. But men were not always there, or if they wore strong aftershaves, I could not smell them. I decided to join the YMCA, where men's bodies are numerous and slick in their sweat. But there, even the women are sweaty, and I couldn't figure out which smell was attracting me. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. Okay, we, don't, we, ha <laughs> we only have, what, five minutes? Oh, oh okay. wow. wow. Right, it's finished at 2.15, right? Oh, oh, no, no, we still have time. Yeah, oh, we have time? Yeah, yeah. Okay, now, my, my poems are not all like that. No. I have one about fishing. Line of sight, look, 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 there, over there. I followed the line of sight indicated by my uncle's index finger and saw nothing but shimmering lights bouncing off the water. A coolie, maybe 15, 20, over there. I looked and looked 
and looked and saw nothing but the lights. Where? There, there, he insisted, shaking his head. It's not that I saw nothing. I saw too much. The movement of the waves, the lights, sparking off each ripple, then a counter movement, a whole undercurrent of a coulee, silver scaled, a flashing wave of light. Okay, we have, we have an example of our first, our new Renshi. Are you interested in our new Renshi? Yes. <laughs> better be. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because, because we're going to read it. Oh, do they have questions about anything we oh, said yeah. or did right now? Do you have any, any, questions? any questions? No. No? Okay, we, people would always ask us, well, what are you working on now? What are you working on now? And so two years ago, we decided, we decided after the suggestion of our friend Juliet to write a Renshi, which we later learned is a docu-Renshi, a documentary Renshi, a Renshi based on historical events. And the historical event that we um, chose was because of the anniversary of the Massey Kahahawai case, which occurred before any of you were born. Mm -hmm. So it's going to come out uh, next, next year. year. So then you can find out. It has to do with an alleged rape and a murder and a trial in which people were set free. So this is the first. You're going to start, Christy? Should we? Okay. Yeah, we'll just we throw them in. You background or afterwards? It will be exciting then. Well, because okay. they're going to start with ignorance. We'll start with me, with ignorance. <laughs> okay. Reading assignment. Standards honor killing, a prelude. I don't want to read this story. Don't want to know their names, imagine their faces. I catch my breath as the words surface. Tin can alley, bare feet football, brown skin boys wearing white silk shirts. See them behind the wheel, immortal for the night. Hear the ease in their laughter, stronger than daylight and the poor. Too close to home. It is my father's story of his Hawaii. There were few comforts, but there were dances at the Alawai Club, violets in Kalihi, stew bowl for 25 cents. There were beatings, japs, haoles, blalas, and curfew. Dirty cops way too willing. Rats that climbed up tin gutters. Girls with nice legs who gave it up easy. And if you were lucky, real lucky, a job at the shipyard. Was different back then, Chris. No can believe was so hard. But we work, go drink, talk story, forget for a little while. This is not Michener's Hawaii. I skip to the end where she commits suicide and like a child burning ants feel a false sense of power. The end gathers me up for the journey back. This story is the unwanted family heirloom, the ugly vase, the chip china, the bastard child everyone whispers about, but no one calls by name. One Call, Sunday, September 13, 1931. Saturday night wasn't busy at the Kapiolani building, so no one from the Honolulu police could predict an early morning phone call that changed Hawaii forever. Before the call came, Agnes Peoples walked into the building at 12.45 a.m. Agnes said her husband was driving when they encountered a car filled with men where King and Liliha intersect. Although the cars didn't hit, Agnes and a man from the other car fought, resulting in blood seeping from her ear. She remembered the car's license number, 58985, and Cecil Ricard recorded her statement. The phone rings at 1.47 a.m., so Captain Hans Kashiwabara picks up. Tommy Massey reports an assault and wants the police to visit his house. The captain calls Detective John Jardine. Then Jardine call, contacts Ricard, who instructs police to drive to the Massey home. Detective Harbottle, Detective Furtottle, and Officer Simerson listen as Thalia Macy speaks. She was at the Alawai Inn and went for a walk at about midnight when a car with four or five Hawaiians came by. She was forced into the car and punched. They drove her to a secluded area, removed her 
from the car to the bushes and raped her six or seven times. They raped her, she alleged, six or seven times in her beautiful green dress. I was that green dress. Now I am the ghost of that green dress. These days I float ethereally from where the Alawai Inn stood and down John Ina Road near Fort DeRussi, where people, Mrs. George Goez, Alice Araki, and Eugenio Batangba call, testif testified they saw me pass them by, which places me in the area late that night. I am the ghost of the green dress that Thalia wore when she said she was abducted by five young locals and brought to a place, dark, isolated, desolate, in Alamoana, known as Beach Road, where only a few small fishing boats creaked in the dark and dogs whined, their cries coming from the old animal quarantine station. I was very decent as the ocean in a green bloom of limu, a green that accentuated the color of her fair, fair skin, her light, soulful eyes, and red lips, fine brown hair. To have seen her, you would have been hard-pressed to say she was pretty, but unconventionally attractive. She was taller than most women in the islands and had the kind of lugubrious chickness made of money and unhappiness as she walked away from the inn in an inebriated sway. In the car where she said she was raped, I don't remember if I were lifted gently from her legs or shoved up to her waist with trembling hands or pressed by desire against the heaving want and weight of desperate men. I don't remember if they nestled their need into my neckline as they drooled into her cleavage, if they even did indeed. After whatever happened, once at home, I was taken off and hung like a scarecrow in her bedroom. She called the police to say she'd been beaten and raped, and the detectives came to take her statement. But Detective Bill Furtado and his partner, George Harbottle, did not inspect me much, hanging in her room. Only much later was I scrutinized, whereupon they found but a tiny blood spot and a bit of soil, nothing more. I remained green, was clean. I don't know when it happened. Maybe this part folded into my imagination. But some months later, I was stripped from the hanger and stumped on in anger. Torn across the border, bodice, I was dragged out and taken to the backyard, where I was hung and set on fire, burned in effigy. Burned in effigy. It ain't in effigy I want to burn them, but in the flesh, real bones covered in dark skins. The papers didn't give her name, just said a beautiful young woman, cultured and of gentle bearing. For sure she was white and raped. We wouldn't stand for that where I come from. That's what my buddy said. Maybe he's right. My own blood boiled seeing them black boys right on top, on top, mind you, of white girls. Even on surfboards, it still ain't right, skin on skin. On the beach, they're laughing, strumming ukulele, singing, smiling, oh yes, smiling. And then those colored girls, here, don't act polite. You say hello, they look right through you like you're not even there. At home, no girl treated me that way. This ain't no dreamy Hawaii, no joy zone. The movies lie. Things ain't right here. Coloreds don't know their place. We heard the Admiral call them rapists, sordid people, brutes and hoodlums. Two of them are even from that orange race, the one they say gonna fight one day. My buddy told me, I just had no guts because I didn't want to go down to the jail and burn them. Then he shoves the paper in my face. Read those names. Ida, Chang, Kahahavai, Takai, Akakuelo. What are they? Not American. That's the first link. Any questions? Question? Comments? This is what you call a documentary history. This is the history of Hawaii, what Hawaii was like in 1931.
a long gone time, I hope. People are asked us, why do we want to dig up this part of history? It's not so pretty. But if we don't remember it, we won't know how to recognize it when we see it. Do you guys get a sense of what is going on? I mean, that was just the first link. What, what are you guys gathering from? Go ahead. No right or wrong. What are you guys gathering or thinking is happening? You feel troubled? I think she's lying, maybe. There's a, there's, she's lying. There's Who's a, lying? The girl. So what, what's happening, you think? Because he's already lived to uh, what's going on. What, yeah. What's actually going on? Because we're not, we're not telling like a full story. We're giving you like perspective, yeah? And my poem starts with, I'm just reading the story and kind of blown away. Anne goes into a different perspective. Julia's talking about a dress. Yeah, and I'm trying to show what, because the military dominated the economy of Hawaii at this time. And they were building up the military in preparation for a war with the orange race, which at that time meant Japan. They called them the orange race. So there was this conflict between the military and the locals. Mm -hmm. And there's all this racism. When you listen to her book, especially, you can see this. At one time, they wanted to declare what? What was it they wanted to declare? Martial, martial, martial law here because of this case. So, what do you think happened in this case? Or just can you can you gather it from the? For, or do you guys need more? Not that we're going to read more. But <laughs> <laughs> are you able to kind of tell what's going on? If you because you guys, do you guys know the case of Masika Hawaii? No, it's it's prominent, really but so, a lot of people don't wow. know it. So, okay, so that's kind of good. We have a test yeah. subject. Here. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so, so what are you guys gathering is happening then? Like, I think he's cued in on it. Did anybody else, like, think of what's going on, kind of what's going on? What's, what's happening? What's happening at all? Now, what is what's standard? the crime? What is standard's title There's of this book? Huh? What is standard's title of his Honor. book? Honor, Honor killing. killing. Yeah. Honor killing. So there's that, a rape, right? That that's mentioned. So there's a rape. Do you, can you guys gather from these who the rape occurred to, or who, what type of person? Yeah. Not type skin color. White. White girl. Brown girl. White girl. White, white girl. girl. White girl was raped. And who can you could you have gathered from this first four? readings who's alleged to have raped her or even if a rape occurred because you are you hit on it like, was she even raped yeah yeah who's who's the possible perpetrator she named the people i named the the five yeah, the five. yeah. Yes. so you got the local boys that are being pulled into this and in Anne's poem she was reciting the police call of where these five boys were actually at getting into a beef with a very belligerent woman across town when this supposed rape is happening someplace else. And, and police work back then is way different than how it is right. now. Nobody would have destroyed the dress, right? Mm -hmm. But in this case, they burned it at some point. Well, there was an uproar in society. So that, that's the case we chose to, because to, to, what's going on in society today with race wars? Or what's going on in the news? Is this still an issue? Mm -hmm. It's still an yeah. issue. Right? It's still an issue. issue. What's that? It's just made out to be an issue. I mean, granted, there's some examples of racism, but they're like small. Um, they're like very small examples of racism that could be easily treated. But the way that our media plays out these days is they love to uh, sell carnage and uh, distrust. The media loves to sell carnage and distrust to the viewers to get ratings. And so if one example, one rare example of any um, uh, issue arises, they're going to exploit it to the point where riots happen. Like, let's take the example of Ferguson. A lot of people say that in Ferguson it was a, a man shooting an unarmed black teenager, but the uh, the people who looked into the crime actually saw that the guy the guy was actually charging off uh, after the officer to get his gun, but 
and the guy shot in self-defense. Now, we can argue this all we want, but at the end of the day, this, uh, this uh, one specific um, uh, issue eventually um, uh, started a riot. And another case was with, within Baltimore, which was wrong, but one was rare, and two involved some cops which were basically cops of uh, who were non-white cops in the first place and arrested a uh, person who they had a criminal record. But in the end, when what happened is because the media likes to portray, likes to uh, blow things out of proportion, and a lot of these activists like to do the same thing too, we eventually end up getting race riots and things that uh, don't need to occur because basically what happens is, what the happens is, is because the media likes carnage so much, they take one rare issue and blow it so out of proportion that it becomes like a major national crisis to the point where, like I said, riots occur and just general carnage ensues. Okay. Well, well, a I, similar I, thing well, happened about this rape yeah. case too, yeah. Yeah, yeah. because the mainland newspapers had it all over their front page about how white people were not safe in Hawaii, mm -hmm. which is why they wanted the military to have martial law here. So the media are always trying to sell their medium. So they may not like carnage, but carnage sells. They can make money. And people will take whatever they read and go off with it. So that, that's, why, that's where you have to be critical in your thinking, Thank right? You. Because, um, um, but aside from the race relationship between blacks and whites in America, I think um, we need to just take a look at here, what is happening here? Because we just had a case with McDonald's where the guy who was white, he shot the local man, right? And it, nasty case reverberated. They talked about the Massey case right off the bat. There was the, the tension. Just yesterday, I read about the Samoans or Polynesians, that's what they call it. This man called Polynesians could not go into this bar. They're banned from the bar, which we don't do in Hawaii. I mean, that's a real no no. Um, he was white. He said, No, you can't have Polynesians in here. But I mean, that kind of thing is really, really, to me, egregious. I thought that's against the law. Yeah, it is. Yeah, you can't do that. But he said because they were disruptive and stuff like that. But, you know, I mean, it bubbles up every once in a while. Once so. in a while. Yeah. But there is a murder associated with this. Mm -hmm. yeah. A murder. Yeah. That's the really bad part. That's the really bad part. One of those. Well, anyway. Wait until our book comes out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and it, it was a heavy thing. I mean, you know, the whites really had the power. And whenever some local person, um, they had lynchings, a couple of lynchings in Hawaii. Um, and, you know, when somebody was, was not white, was convicted, his sentence was immediately carried out, right? Oh, that like was the Japanese, the yeah, Fukunaga case. Like yeah, that. but we have yeah. to admit things have changed. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, things have yeah. changed, but then sometimes we assume things because we don't know our past. Yeah. And so we wanted, to have, we, we wanted to have some kind of way to, what, what Juliet said, have critical thinking about what we read. Yeah. And there's never one color is right or another color is wrong. There's it's much more complicated than that. Do you think that's going to be included um, in the documentary? Yeah. yeah. Like how the present is compared to the past? Wow, that's yeah. deep. Well, I think in our reflections, we're going to talk about each poem as yeah. we write. Okay. I mean, uh, as because that's what we have in the book. We have the links, and then we, we discuss how we wrote each link. But this time, I mean, I found that I, I was so ignorant I'm still ignorant in Hawaiian history. But this one kind of opened, like the first link of Christie. Christie is speaking for me. Oh, yeah. Didn't know anything. So this is opening up a whole page in what I should have learned when I was your age or before I was 
But we never we never learned Hawaiian history when it's I was in elementary school. It's supposed to be school. taught in schools. We're told. Yeah, that. we're told, mm -hmm. but they usually say. Sorry, oh, and you this guys never. Mistake. You guys went to school here. No. no. Some yes, some no. Um, the people who have gone through school here are supposed to have that as part of their curriculum, unless you are uh, in private schools and they they dictate their own. Well, curriculum. people don't want to talk about things. It's very difficult. It's difficult. It is about race. It is about uh, false accusations. It's about a time frame different from now. The things that were done back then and understood back then and accepted back then, very very much not so now. So when you're reading and going back and you're identifying. As I did, because my father grew up in these places. That's how I come to this is my father's room. So he would tell me all these stories and how he grew up in these areas. And my father is dark. I'm white like my mother. But my father is a mok and he is dark. So he, he would tell me all his stories and all this stuff. And you cannot help. My, my reflections are more of a self-identification as I'm learning this. And I'm going, wow. You know, I just cannot believe in all these things. And we tried to trying to keep to the history. But yes. Let me give you an example of how I, I really screwed it up. I'm talking about the green dress, right? But I'm talking, in my mind, I had a color wrong. And I'm talking about a different green dress. Huh? Yeah. It's a green, but it's more like a, a blue. No, it's like a very washed out green. I'm thinking of a very, a darker green. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, I'm reading some history, and I go, oh, I wrote a whole poem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, you know. Nobody knows. <laughs> which no, but I have, I'm going to do you don't that say in, my in my reflection. Oh. I'm going to talk about how history sometimes, you know. Are, are you guys creative writers in here? Yeah. Have you guys ever attempted to, to straddle the that type of writing, where, uh, is your writing strictly creative and only in that realm, or does it straddle some reality, some creativity, and fiction, non-fiction, does it blur, I guess? I I find that mo yeah, most of my writing starts from something in it's my life, uh -huh. so. and then it goes outward. Mm -hmm. This was very difficult, because you're trying to stay true to the, yeah, document to, to the history, and then at the same time, uh, you have a hard time to really connect with what's going on, so you really don't even want to really go deeply into it. So it's really difficult to yeah, write this type of poetry. But I, one thing I learned about, I used to always wonder why my, I guess my uncle, I would say, he was a racist. He couldn't have said anything good about Howie's. He could never say anything good about black. He, I said, why is he such a racist? You know, Of course, today people would say that's not racism because he, he was on the bottom of the, the uh, ladder. but. The times in Hawaii were were different, and people people really felt their place right. from their color. Actually, if I may, you don't have to necessarily be on the top to be racist. Like, for example, a lot of the people in uh, Germany at the time of the Weimar Republic who weren't Jews were basically at the bottom, while the Jews were at the top. And yet, as soon as Adolf Hitler came to power, the Holocaust occurred. The same thing happened with uh, basically the Hutus and the Tutsis in, uh, uh, in uh, Rwanda. 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 Yeah. And that basically occurred the same way. And also, it happened in, it basically happened pretty much any, any time a person sees uh, even the elites in general, regardless of race or religion, as the uh, enemy and as is not human, it always results in uh, catastrophes. Yeah. It, occurred in Germany, Russia, and China, Cambodia, Cambodia especially, in fact worst of all in Cambodia because Cambodia got to the extent where they just basically the government, the new uh, people who came to power just came to power to just basically eliminate everything about society and just rape the land. Yes, yeah, I have a poem about that too. <laughs> One of the things I thought was so wonderful about using this medium of the linked poems and having four poets tell the story was shown so wonderfully in the four poems you just shared because we had the different voices, literally different voices from address, from somebody starting to learn the story like all of us readers are, and then a kind of a very factual, and then we had somebody in the moment who's a bystander but participant and 
I just thought it was really wonderful to see the story, not like a history. Thank you. But it's, it's okay. Oh, wow. We're doing something oh, good. good. <laughs> <laughs> but and I want to have the history, the, the missing, I think, we yeah. need to. Yes, and having that would be, that's we, just. We, that's we so want it to have it rooted in facts and not fantasy. Oh, yeah, but it's wonderful the way you're, yeah. you're bringing us in in different ways with thank different perspectives. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Are there family members that are related to this case yeah. who have responded to it being written about? Oh, yeah. wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that very issue stymied, I mean, stopped us from writing for a while because yeah. we, we had planned to publish it and then we just kind of laid off because we heard that the Kahavai family did, was very sensitive to this whole thing. Yeah. But I then... Think, I think, um, I know for myself, learning this, I felt uh, very foolish. Like, how can I be like, I'm ensconced in my Hawaiian culture, I take hula, I do all this stuff, and I know nothing about my roots. And as for this, this case, when you read this story, it touched stones everything about Hawaiian culture, economy, all these things that lead up to us today. I'm not saying that this is everything, but it touches everything in this case. When you learn about this, you're like, holy smokes. Economy, culture, uh, society. society, everything coming to a head. And I felt like, wow, I knew nothing. How and, ignorant yeah. was I? And I thought, wow, I kind of was up on things. And I, no, I got kind of stifled. So the Kahaha Bais, getting back to that, one of the uh, boys that were accused initially, and... Um, they were actually uh, innocent of this accusation, though they had to go through horrendous uh, Trial. trials for, from this accusation. They were, one of the boys was murdered, and that's the Kahaabai, uh, the Joseph Kahaabai. And because of that outcome of that case, and at end of the time, there's a lot of shame, even though they were innocent, yeah. their families distanced themselves from these boys, they, it, was, it was not, like now where you go like, and you're innocent, I'm gonna stand by you. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of, oh, mm -hmm. let me get my distance from this person. But this is seminal in a way because this brought the local people together. Yes. And the term and local is supposed to came, came from that time. But so getting back to your question, we heard from somebody who knows the Kahawai family and they realized how important it is that we remember. So yeah. they're not so I against. Think as I'm writing this, even though sometimes I might take a, voice that, because we want to be objective and you take a voice that might not be in alignment with your own personal views. Mm -hmm. I think at the formal, at the forefront of my mind I wanted to honor these men who are mostly forgotten. They're just kind of, they, you know, they kind of got erased almost. And there were other heroes because the jury that was a hung jury when the, the boys were um, tried for rape were made up from a cross section of the whole society, not all Hawaiians, not all Hawaiians, they're all mixed, mm -hmm. and they came to the right conclusion. So, you know, there are all kinds of people you can say work for, yeah. well, work for justice. Yeah, yeah but, uh, so, yeah, I don't know if that answered you, that was kind of long-winded of me, sorry about that. But, um, yeah, some of the Kahawais are still out there. I'm sure that there's family lineages that go on, but. His is, I guess, the most prominent name because he was murdered of, of the defendants that were uh, accused. At the bottom of um, Kamehameha schools, there's a um, sort of like a potter's graveyard there. Yeah. Um, and his body is there. Oh, Kahavai, yeah. Ka um, Kapalama. Kapalama, yeah. And, um, by, the, by the shopping center. If you're interested, Honor Killing is a good book, yeah. and it's heavy though. It's, it's a it's a heavy read. You know, it's not like light chick flick. It's, it's a heavy book. <laughs> <laughs> it's a heavy book. Don't, don't take it on the airplane on a long flight. It might be in a closed space. No, because I would have to read it. I have to put it down. Oh, yeah, okay, I gotta read some more. You know, it, it's a very you gotta take it in bites kind of book. For me, it was anyway. Yeah. And bad words would go through my mind. <laughs> I just so mad. So any other questions? So when you're doing this, the entry, or the any, any, uh, or specifically this one, like, there's probably like, thousands of these voices coming in. Like, how am I going to write this, or what yeah. do I want to say? 
Is there like a specific voice that you stick with first, or how do you pick? You know, we could have done this anyway, and that and when we talked actors might have been more coherent. Mm -hmm. Like I maybe I would say like Thalia is the woman that was raped, and if I had just taken not her persona but from her perspective and stuck with it throughout each of my works, that may have been one way to do it. We allowed ourselves the free reign to to pick whatever chronologically I handed off to Anne. So when it came back to Jean and Jean moved the story to wherever it is, I picked whatever voice made yeah. sense to me there. And what you'll find starkly is that we do not take on major characters. Yeah, we talked, I mean, some of us talked about um, like one of the, the yeah. uh, guys who got, you know. Uh, That's what's missing. I mean, I tried to take uh, Kahaha Vai's voice, but you know, we don't have any words that he really spoke. So that's what we're doing research on. We're trying to find whether this, if we have any quotes from them. Because at this present time, we have no real, real, yeah. real, real voice from them. Because we didn't feel, I mean, I didn't feel like assuming. It's hard this. to assume yeah. what they're going through and feeling it. And, and, and in that writing this, I felt like I let them down. You know, but we have a chance to do something about it in our commentary. Yeah. As you can see, there was a lot of thought, and we, we felt a responsibility to to show this what would happen, you know, and be as honest and factual as we, we could, you know. So, um, and I think that's why it resulted in, you know, basically we 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 got what we knew based on the facts uh, from a lot a lot from honor killing, and then um, what we didn't know, um, we, we just kind of um, we, we might have shied away from uh, mm -hmm. from those yeah. topics, but yeah. You ever look back on uh, in your pieces and say, like, you're reading it through again and go, wow, I could have said it this way or better, or... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We could have written up tons of different poems. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, with, uh, with this book, we, we had the rule, you can't change it. Okay. We, ch we, we corrected grammar, we corrected spelling, but we couldn't really basically change anything. But this one, we decided. we decided that we have a certain leeway to fix it up. So when you say like the original, like it has like, um, the original had like thousands of rules, so just say it, it kind of builds up its own social norm or like its own rules when you're making the... The, the rules, you mean the in the original Renga and Renku? They kind of like that, but because uh, you said that the Renchi is doing now, we had um, stuck with two rules. So. Yeah. Yeah. Turning it on time and yeah. yeah. Turning it on time and use the last. That's we, that's we had this time restriction again. Yeah. yeah. We did. We did. Two but we had two weeks, weeks one. not yeah. one week. Right. If you do this kind of link poetry, I encourage you to go shorter time frame. Yeah. You need the pressure. You need the pressure of writing it. It comes off fresh. So if you guys make a link like you guys are here, don't go longer than a week. Because there's something about that time pressure that puts out something creative that you just. You just it just comes and it's actually a good thing. It's a good thing. Yeah, I think the pressure is a good thing. I, 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 yeah. Oh, go ahead. And don't start with something like documentary. Don't. Worry. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> just, wow, that was really because we're like, oh, no, so let's make it harder. Let's make every poem about the letter seven or something. We're trying to figure out how to make it more elevated. Restrict. Yeah. Well, I would like to thank you for your intelligent questions, yes. your probing questions about this issues, you know, because that fulfills my grant. <laughs> <laughs> Hawaii Council for the Humanities. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much. Yeah. This is very good. And thank you for yeah, being attentive re uh, listeners because uh, we don't know how we project yeah. impact or, you know, yeah. and it, it's, it's good to hear that we're connecting, with connecting you. on some level. Because you didn't walk out. <laughs> <laughs> any last questions or anything else you guys want to know about this, about anything else? Well, don't forget her book is coming out. Yes. Come okay. to the White Book and Music yeah. Festival. I'll be there. And, and uh, probably Still Out of Place <laughs> is the title. Still Out of Place. Yeah. I don't know if you guys feel that way. <laughs> I'm still out of place. <laughs> Trying to find home. Is that it? Thank you very much.